Thank you everyone so much for joining us this evening. With that, I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Nia, who's gonna serve as our moderator this evening. Well, yeah, hi everybody. Thank you so much for doing this. I think we're gonna start with introductions. So Emily, could you start? You're the first one on my screen. I have to remember to unmute myself. Um, hey guys, my name is Emily Carlin. Um, I graduated in the class of 2013 and I am the communications director for US Congressman Anthony Gonzalez who represents Ohio's 16th district. So we're the west side of Cleveland down towards College of Worcester and then we take an L over to the suburbs of the Canton Akron area. Um, he's a freshman in Congress so I've worked for him for about two years now. Um, I went to George Washington University after Academy for my master's and my bachelor's. Um, and I think that just about covers it. I've been on Capitol Hill in the House of Representatives ever since I graduated. Um, so that's sort of where I've made my nest. Um, anything I'm missing, Nia, that you want me to include in there? No, that was perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, Brad, you can go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Brad Pyle, uh, class of 2007. I'm the political director at the Humane Society Legislative Fund. Uh, our organization represents millions of members across the country. Um, we've got about 600 staff worldwide that we work with. Uh, we interface with regulatory agencies and elected officials like Emily's boss on a daily basis. Uh, after Academy, I went to Ohio State for my bachelor's degree and Case Western for my JD and my MBA. Uh, spent several years working on campaigns in Ohio and a few other places, and then came to D.C. Thank you so much. Um, Jeff. Hi, everyone. Uh, I also graduated in 2007 from Columbus Academy. It's a nice little reunion here. <laughs> and uh, I work currently for the Ohio Secretary of State's office as Senior Elections Counsel. So uh, the Secretary of State oversees elections for the state, and uh, you may have heard there's one going on right now. So it's a busy time. Okay, thank you, everybody. I think we'll start with the first question. So you all kind of answered this already, but you can just reiterate. Um, where did you go for your post-academy degrees, and did you feel like academy did a good job preparing you for those academic successes? I think we can start with Emily again. Yeah, sure. Um, I, so as I said, I went to George Washington University in DC for both my undergraduate and my postgrad, my graduate degree. Um, it was the perfect place for me to go because I sort of had an idea of what I wanted to do. Uh, it was right in the heart of everything. The thing that got me was they talked about all of the internships you could do while you were in college. So I actually did eight internships while an undergraduate, which is unheard of at most schools, but just about average for a GW kid. <laughs> Brad's nodding like, yeah, we yeah. have seen those. <laughs> um, so I was one of those kids, uh, but it was awesome because it meant that I got to launch a career where I already, like I walked in day one post-grad knowing what I was doing, knowing where I was, knowing where I was going on Capitol Hill because I'd been there before. Um, and I meant that I got to skip a little bit of a step. I never had to be a staff assistant. I went directly into being um, a communications assistant slash press secretary, uh, which was awesome um, and gave me sort of just like a head start to getting to where I am now. Um, it meant that I could be a 23 year old communications director when I got my job, which was super cool. I was one of the youngest on the Hill um, when I got my job, which was awesome. And I'm super proud of that. Um, but GW is a great place, totally recommend. If anyone's interested in it, um, feel free to hit me up and ask questions. Happy to talk about it all day. <laughs> um, but Columbus Academy made it super easy for me to transition into that. Um, I, my writing abilities coming out of Academy were just like everyone else was here and the average Academy student was way up here. Uh, that has carried me through from my freshman year of college where I got literally a 100% on every paper I turned in for the first semester <laughs> and carried me all the way through to my job today where I'm writing everything from tweets to op-eds um, for in press releases for my boss speaking through his voice every day. Uh, and I totally credit Pat Hogan, who's on this call with a lot of that writing ability 
Uh, my papers came back from her class inked in red, <laughs> but it made me the best writer ever for what I wanted to do and or what I ended up doing um, in my real life. So thank you to Academy for that. You guys gave me all of the tools that I really needed. And then GW just kind of put the finishing polishes, polishes on it and taught me how to do my actual job. Um, but the foundations that Academy put in there for me was the difference 100% of the way between getting to where I am at my age now and having a much bigger learning curve and being able to get there. Well, I'm glad all the papers we're writing right now will lead to something. <laughs> the red marks uh, pay off. <laughs> I hope so. Um, Brad, could you tell us a little bit about your side of it? Definitely. I mean, I Plus one for everything Emily just said, I remember struggling through <laughs> Mrs. Hogan's class in academy as well and getting to college and being at the front of every English class I ever took and coasting right through law school as well. Um, knowing to just write for the audience rather than what you think it should look like was a, a great skill. I definitely agree on the importance of interning early. I similarly walked right out of college into great jobs because I had interned in campaigns and in political organizations in Ohio all through undergrad um, and through grad school and walked out and was the youngest campaign manager in the caucus and all of those things. And it was because we knew to go get internships and we were prepared because of Academy um, to do those. And Academy set, sets you up so much for success that you're not gonna realize it until you get to college, but you're ready. I'm glad. Being a senior, it seems kind of scary on this side of it. Okay, Jeff, could you tell us a little bit about your side? Sure. Uh, so I went to Wheaton College in Illinois after graduating from Columbus Academy. It's a, a small liberal arts college uh, just west of the city. And uh, I was actually a piano performance major. So not the typical background for someone to then go on to law school, but um, I enjoyed it, got a well-rounded education. And I think I would say to graduating seniors, it's okay not to know uh, what you'll do for a career when you reach the end of college and find something that you enjoy, something that challenges you. And um, if you put your all into it, it, it does work out. Um, I did decide I didn't want to make music my career and uh, kind of digging deeper into what my interests were, kind of went back to, from my years at Columbus Academy, uh, studying government, public policy, and uh, writing. I, th those were the subjects I enjoyed the most, and law school was a way for me to enter public service. Um, so Columbus Academy really did prepare me well for it, and I continue to think back to those days a lot. Um, so we know where you went to school. Could you tell us what you majored in? And then how much did your major impact, like what you ended up going into for your career? I know Jeff, you kind of just gave us a little bit about that, but if you could tell, talk a little bit more about that, please. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my path was a little unusual in that I am not doing a, for a career what I studied in college per se, although uh, at a liberal arts college, you, you do kind of get a wide enough range of subjects that um, it can be a, a launching pad uh, to go in different directions. Um, I studied music throughout my, my childhood, was pretty involved in music at Columbus Academy. And actually in recent years have done piano accompanying for a lot of Columbus Academy students. Uh, I live just uh, about 10 miles away. So uh, you may know the previous orchestra teacher, Mrs. Bush, I've done accompanying for her students. Um, I ended up going to law school afterward. And um, I think you, you don't have to do pre-law if you want to go down that course at, or political science. I would just encourage students to find what they're interested in. 
Thank you. Um, Brad, could you tell us what you majored in and how it impacted your career? Definitely. Um, bachelor's degree was in business administration, um, focused on information systems and the computer software. Uh, my law degree was specialized on piracy law on the high seas. Um, and none of that has anything to do with my career. Like Jeff said, um, you don't have to know what you want to be when you grow up to go to college and get a degree in something that's well-rounded and go on to law school and go on to do something totally different. Um, so find something that you're interested in and lean in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Emily, could you tell us a little bit about you? Yeah. So I think I'm actually an anomaly in that my, <laughs> my major is exactly what I did or what I do now. Um, I majored in political communications and then I got my master's in media and strategic communications right after that um, while working full-time on the Hill. So I just sort of did both at once, um, which I don't recommend. Don't do that. Um, it was a bad idea, especially when I was in an office where we were going to lose the election. Um, don't do it too much, too much going on. Um, however, um, I'm glad that I got my master's. Um, but I don't think that's normal for someone to know what they're doing or know what they want to do in undergrad. Most people don't, most people sort of have more of a winding path towards it. Um, for me, I discovered the program at GW that I wanted to do while at Academy after I'd gotten into GW. So I didn't, there was, I had to apply separately to my program. So it probably would have been a little bit easier if I had figured it out like two months earlier <laughs> before sending in the application. Um, but I, I got there eventually and, um, it just sort of made sense for me because I had a lot of theater that I loved doing at Academy. That was my thing. Um, I, I played sports too, but theater and choir were my, where I felt at home and happy and comfy. Um, and that's where a lot of my friends were. So that was my thing. Um, and I got to combine what I loved about that, which was the performance aspect of it with something that made me feel really mentally stimulated, which is the political science aspect of it. Um, so I studied essentially the joining point between how the media operates and how political science works. Um, and that's what I studied both in undergraduate and in grad school. Um, and then of course the use of that for your own purposes. <laughs> I studied political manipulation in a lot of ways, <laughs> to put it blankly, for, to put it bluntly, but, um, I'm, a norm, I'm not normal in that that's what I knew I wanted to do and then did. Um, most people have a lot more of a winding path. I have a, one of my best friends from college was a journalism major and always thought that she was gonna work at Politico or The Hill. Um, and so we, we shared a lot of classes because I had to take journalism classes, she had to take political communications classes so that we could both understand each other's arts. Um, She's not worked in journalism for more than 30 days since when she graduated college. <laughs> and that's really normal for a lot of people to have um, sort of a change in what they think they want to do, or you discover something new um, that you didn't know existed in college because um, you're exposed to this whole new array of opportunities and experiences and classes that you've never heard of. Um, so my biggest advice would be to go out and explore those classes when you get to college and find something new and different because it might be what you love. Um, and don't worry about making sure you pick the right thing. Sometimes you pick something that you're never going to end up using, but it's going to still give you great experiences and great learning techniques um, to help you down the road in whatever career path you do end up in. So while I did go to a major that is still very salient to what I do every day, that's not necessarily normal and I wouldn't even necessarily encourage that for everyone, because I think that there's something to be said for having an experience outside of your career to bring that knowledge in. Thank you so much. Um, well, you just said you kind of went on a straight path, but everybody else kind of went on a roundabout path to their current career. So how did all of you get into your current roles and how did Academy help you get there? I think we can start with Jeff. Sure. Uh, so I went to law school in upstate New York and honestly didn't anticipate returning to Ohio. Um, a lot of my peers headed to New York City or DC, um, the large cities. And I, 
I, I didn't have a job lined up right out of law school and uh, ended up moving back to Columbus. And uh, fortunately, by the time I had taken the bar exam, uh, found an opportunity through uh, the state legislature. I, I worked for uh, the nonpartisan uh, staff for the, the state legislature. It's called the Legislative Service Commission. Um, basically, we're like the ghost writers that uh, would write the legislation uh, based on requests from Republicans or Democrats, um, all of the legislators. And I, I did that for about four years. Um, got a lot of experience in that realm of government. And then an opportunity came uh, just through someone I had done work for there uh, who moved on to the Ohio Secretary of State's office. And um, so I, I wouldn't say it was a direct connection to Columbus Academy, but definitely the, the skills from uh, great education I had there. Thank you so much. Um, Brad, would you like to talk a little bit about your experience? Definitely. I, um, you know, I got involved in the College Democrats as soon as I got to college and was registering students to vote and then interning with campaigns. Um, and then, you know, immediately after that, working on them and um, interacting with elected officials on a daily basis. If you want to work in politics, every college and university has a College Democrats and a College Republicans. And whichever side you're on, go and find those people because they know how to get you plugged into those internships and those first jobs. And it'll work. And if you show up and work hard, you'll be the youngest press secretary on the Hill or the youngest campaign manager in the caucus. And Academy just prepares you for that because you're a freshman in college operating like a junior or senior would be. And you can get those internships and really excel. And you just have a head start on everybody else. And that's what happened to me, it sounds like that's what happened to Emily too. Um, so just you know, be, be bold and get, get started early. Thank you so much. Emily, would you like to talk about yours? Yeah, um, so I actually never was a member of um, college Republicans or college Democrats, um, college Republicans in my case, um, never was a member of that in college because I decided to do other things with my free time. I did a lot of student theater in college. Um, but I actually got plugged in on the Hill through Academy grads. Um, I was looking for my first internship, trying to figure out, okay, I know a lot of being in DC and trying to get your foot in the door on the Hill is who, you know, um, so let's see who I know. Let's see what connections I have. I got, I made myself a LinkedIn, set it up in my dorm room one night. <laughs> um, did a quick search to see what Academy grads were in DC and then found two people who were actually working in Senator Portman's office at the time. Um, and they, I messaged them on LinkedIn, they responded. And three days later on my Friday without classes, I was over on the Hill at a conference table in Senator Portman's office, asking them how they got to where they were and how could I do the same thing? What advice do they have for me? How do I get plugged in with internships? Um, and that's sort of how I got my foot in the door and figured out how to maneuver in that world. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out wherever you go, whatever industry you end up in. Don't be afraid to reach out to your network from Columbus Academy. Um, I have never reached out to someone and have them turn me down. <laughs> they will at least respond to you, even if they can't meet, um, even if they don't have time for a phone call. I've never once not at least gotten a response that was like, hey, wish you the best, good luck. Here's my like quick 30 seconds of advice. If not, let's grab coffee tomorrow or let's grab coffee on Friday. And how can I help you? Like everyone has been super welcoming and helpful in the alumni world. I 10 out of 10 recommend reaching out. Um, that was honest to God, the resource that got me in the door that first time. Um, so 100% recommend using LinkedIn, using the alumni office. Um, they will help connect you to things. That's also how I got my first job not through Academy, but through um, GW, I had a, a professor of mine was a lobbyist and had access to like in his, he was a professor at night and a lobbyist during the day for his day job. Um, he had access to a database of all the Hill staffers. And we went through, he helped me write an email. We went through and found everyone who'd graduated in my major or one other similar major who worked in a communications job 
for a Republican on the Hill. And we emailed them with that form email he helped me write. And I got responses from I probably a half the people we emailed and I got coffee with about half of those people. Um, and, and that's how I ended up with my first job on Capitol Hill is one of those people that I got coffee with in February when they left their job in July called me and said, Hey, we had a really great coffee. I was really impressed by you. Do you want to interview for my job? And it was a California office that I had absolutely no other connections to would have never have thought to interview for that office because I'd never been to California. <laughs> I didn't know the first thing about Central Valley, California. I don't know the first thing about almonds, but apparently they pronounce some amens there. <laughs> but that's how use those connections, because that was 100 percent how I first got my foot in the door for internships and then how I first got my foot in the door for a job. Um, so don't be afraid to use those alumni networks. Um, a lot of what happens in politics is who, you know, um, and you guys all know people because you are on this call with us right now. So don't be afraid to use us. There are more of us out in this world. If this is something that you want to do, please, please, please reach out to any of us and we'll all be happy to help you. I assure you. Um, it's a weird world, but once you have someone to mentor you and get your foot in the door, doors will open for you. So please don't hesitate to reach out ever always here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, what was something that, that would surprise people about the work you do? Um, is there anything specific that sticks out in any of your jobs? Emily, we can start with you. Um, something that would surprise people about my job. I don't know if there's that. So my job is very public facing. Um, so there's not a whole lot that would surprise anyone. I don't think necessarily about what I do because you see it all on a daily basis if you're looking for it. Um, I put up tweets. I'm in charge of all the social media. Um, I'm in charge of the messaging. So one, one side of what I do is the press communication. So I'm in charge of talking to reporters, connecting reporters to my boss, connecting reporters to other people who might be helpful for their story. So if, if we're, if my boss went to, um, NASA Glenn on Tuesday, not only do I want the reporter following them as far as they can follow us into NASA Glenn to take those awesome photos, but I want to connect them to the researcher at NASA Glenn who's working on that thing that we did a bill that will help them with three weeks ago so that we're bringing in all of the different perspectives um, and really just setting the reporter up to tell the story that I want the reporter to tell. Um, the, other than that, I write op-eds. So if my boss is done, um, like this week, we're working on editing an op-ed about the China task force that my boss was on, um, where, where we, it was supposed to be bipartisan, but it ended up just being Republicans in the end because Capitol Hill's a weird place <laughs> and that stuff happens. <laughs> um, but we put together, it's like a 80 page report on um, the growing influence of China in a bunch of different areas. Um, and so we were working on an op-ed to talk about what a why this is important for our constituents why does the china issue matter for someone in cleveland working in manufacturing um but b what part did my boss actually play on this task force of like 15 people what was what was our actual contribution to it um so that's something that we've been editing this week um my favorite part of it though um is also the strategy i get to so we our legislative team probably has, we're, we're a freshman member of Congress, which means that we're a little bit more active than a lot of other members of Congress who've been around for longer. We're still sort of trying to earn our stripes. Um, so we've put forth a lot of bills this year and a lot of different issues. And my job is to take all of those different bills that we've done, all of those different site visits my boss has gone on to and create a story with it that makes sense. Um, so we don't talk necessarily a whole bunch about every bill that we do. Some things sort of we do because it's going to make that one pension group that keeps coming to our office happy. <laughs> and, and like that's 2000 constituents right there that we've now made their day, but we're not really going to talk about that because it doesn't fit the rest of our narrative that we're working on where we're talking about jobs in the economy, where we're talking about China, where we're talking about getting kids back to school, um, in the COVID crisis and how do we do that safely, um, especially for the younger kids who um, have a lot harder time learning at home and need the social aspect of it developmentally. Um, how do we implement testing in Ohio with COVID? Um, how do we connect 
our constituents to unemployment benefits that the state's having a hard time delivering because they're being just squashed with the number of people right now um, that need help and they're understaffed for it. And it's hard to staff up that quickly and expand your web capabilities that quickly. So how do we help them do that? And how do we help our constituents get connected to those resources? Um, so I'm telling all of those stories and sort of knitting them into one narrative about who is Anthony Gonzalez? How is he helping Ohio's 16th district? Um, why does he matter for you? So that by the time it gets to this time of year, every other year, where he's running for office, I've now knit a story that our constituents know, recognize, understand, and like. <laughs> um, so that's sort of my aim on a daily basis is take all the different things that we do in our office and pare it down into one story that forms a public impression of, of who is Congressman Anthony Gonzalez and what has he done for me. Um, so that's sort of what I do in my job. Um, the thing that would surprise people is maybe the media training that I get to do. Um, because my boss was new to the Hill, I got to sort of sit him down for the first time and see um, what he was going to be like on TV. <laughs> and he came from the NFL, so he'd had some media training before. Um, he got to sort of do that at Ohio State. He sort of did it in the NFL. Um, but it turns out that he's a lot better at talking with a helmet on where you can't see your face <laughs> versus on cable news where you've got like this of you showing. Um, so I had to teach him how to sort of take the talking with your hands thing and reverse it and actually have facial expressions and look like you're active on camera and look in the right spot and not be like up here talking to the light <laughs> or like down here talking to your feet, not to be like slouching over like this. Um, so that was maybe my favorite part. I came up with a Brutus Buckeye analogy where I was like, you know how Brutus Buckeye has limited, like the character that you see walking around at the games has limited capacity to communicate with people. He doesn't have a space. He only has his body and everything that he does, he's telling a story through his body. It's the exact opposite when you're on TV or when you're on radio, the only thing you have is your voice and your face. And on radio, it's even worse. You only have your voice to tell that story. So you have to have inflection in there. You have to be personable and out front and look engaging and hold people's attention when you're talking to them. Um, and that was sort of the fun aspect of what I got to do in the first couple months um, was to teach him how to do all of that. Um, and I used all of those acting skills that Dill in the theater department taught me and that Mrs. Neal taught me and Mrs. Brooks <laughs> and took those all and transferred those into Anthony Gonzalez so that he can go on Fox News or he can go on CNN and he cannot look like an idiot because <laughs> he's not. He's super smart. So you have to teach him how to just you know, communicate that in a way that's engaging to people. And that's going to help tell that story that we're trying to get across. I really like that analogy. That makes a lot of sense, actually. OK, Brad, could you tell us what was most surprising about the work you do for other people? Definitely. I think the most surprising thing about really any job in politics, whether you're on the nonprofit side like I am, or you're on the Hill or on a campaign, is just the breadth of information that you are going to consume on a daily basis, whether it's working on an issues campaign or working with a candidate to make sure that they are aligned right with a voter group. Or Emily, I'm sure, is learning a lot every time she writes a press release about a bill she knows nothing about. It, I move every day from puppy mills to whales to the wildlife trade in China because of the coronavirus. And every day I feel like I am learning so much more. And it is, it, I've been here for two years and I know more about animals now than I ever did in my life. Um, and it, you will, every time you move a job in DC or in politics, it will be that all over again. Thank you so much, Jeff. Could you give us what was the most surprising with what you do? Sure. Um... So I would say one thing is that my job really is not about politics um, as much as possible. Uh, my job is to make elections fair and secure for, for both sides so that, um, that there's an even playing field for um, whether it's Republican, Democrat, or no party at all. And um, that was true in my my first job as well, working for the nonpartisan side of the legislature. Is um, it was about crafting legislation to be as effective as possible for um, 
whether it was a Republican or Democrats idea. Um, I didn't have as much say in policy as I liked in that job. Now I fortunately do have a little bit more influence on uh, the policies we adopt for uh, administering the elections. But um, my job and the job of the elected secretary of state is really to be um, impartial as much as possible and uh, run the elections in a way that is not political. Okay, thank you all so much for those answers. Um, what are the biggest challenges you're facing or have faced in your current role? And what are some of the struggles you anticipate in the next five, 25 years, or even in the next year? Um, why don't we start with that? Sure, I think um, you know, one of the hardest things always in politics is the just complete unpredictability of it all. Um, you, there are no, long-term plans in politics because you don't know who's going to be in charge in two years or in a week. You can have the best legislative agenda lined up or the best campaign plan and then someone changes their mind or there is suddenly a new issue that's emerging or there's a pandemic or an election happens. And so you've got to be prepared to pivot constantly on issues, on your messaging, on what you're working on that day, on what your budget is, on who you are trying to impress, uh, because now they're in charge suddenly. Um, and so you've got to be quick on your feet and ready to move at a moment's notice. Um, and that's something that comes over time as a skill. It's definitely a learned skill, um, but really a, a big challenge and something you have to be prepared for. Thank you, Emily. Would you like to give us your perspective? Yeah. Um, so from my perspective, I think probably what's been the most challenging is dealing with, with um, a new member of Congress who came in in a really, really tough time to be a new member of Congress. He came in during the longest shutdown in government history. Um, that was when he was sworn in in the middle of it. Um, he came in during the right after that, we transferred transition to the impeachment issue, um, which was in the House which is where our realm is. Um, so he came in with all of these ideas that he want of things that he ran on, that he wanted to accomplish, that he wanted to do. And we were faced with this news cycle where A, nothing was gonna break through that wasn't that. Um, but then B, we had to try to figure out how do we still make an impact for our constituents knowing that we're facing these two really big things that arguably as a freshman in Congress, we really don't have very much control over or ability to fit you. We, and trust me, he tried, <laughs> tried more than I would have probably liked him to be focusing his time on trying, but he was a, is a freshman. So he wanted to do it. Um, but he, he tried to solve some of those problems single-handedly or with a group of other freshmen um, who all wanted to sort of get their feet wet, but that was never going to be the big thing that we were able to accomplish as freshman members of, of Congress. It's just not the reality. It's like being a freshman in high school. You're not suddenly going to be captain your freshman year. If that makes sense. Um, you've got to sort of earn your stripes and work your way up and learn how things are done. Um, so trying to figure out how do we accomplish things in this environment? How do we make a difference for our constituents was sort of the biggest obstacle that we faced as a new member of Congress. What we ended up doing was we um, found smaller issues that had bipartisan support already that were kind of below the line of what was going to get a whole bunch of news coverage and, and be a part of, a, a, get enough coverage that it would trigger partisanship essentially. So if you're below a certain line of salience, people are less likely to form a huge aversion to that issue because it's just not being talked about enough. There, there was no need to draw a line in the sand and go to your separate corners on it because it's not headline news. So we did things like passed a bill, a bill that our um, veteran community in Northeast Ohio came directly to our office asking for. We um, worked on a whole bunch of stuff with online child exploitation of how do we solve this crisis that literally no one can be against solving that crisis. <laughs> How do you find issues that can transcend the political environment we're currently in and actually accomplish something? And by doing that, we ended up being, I think, 
the, the statistic at the end of our first year is you're the most productive freshman Republican in Congress. Um, and we were in the top four most Republican or most um, productive freshmen across both parties, um, which is incredible to do as a Republican who we were in the minority. So you get when you're in the minority party, um, you get a lot less done because it's the majority party that decides what bills go to the floor and get voted on. Um, so for us to be able to get as much done as we did, especially as freshmen, um, where the boss has less connections with other members, not just across the aisle, but on both sides because he's new, um, was a really awesome thing for us to be able to do and something that we're super proud of. Um, but just finding ways to still make a difference while not avoiding the the big issues that are out of our hands for the most part um, and acknowledging them, dealing with them as we needed to, uh, taking opinions on them where we needed to, putting out statements where we needed to, talking about it where we needed to. Um, we did all of that, but the more important thing was finding ways to actually get things done. Um, and I think we were able to accomplish that for the most part, but that was definitely an obstacle that was interesting to face, but challenging to face. Thank you and congratulations on that ranking. That sounds really amazing. Um, Jeff, could you tell us a little bit about what the challenges you're facing or have faced have been? Well, uh, running an election in a pandemic is really a whole different ballgame than we've experienced before. Um, it's more absentee voting than ever in history. Uh, that's voting by mail or early. It's having more health precautions and probably the most sanitary election in history. Um, we had to work through logistics of getting just gallons and gallons of hand sanitizer and uh, personal protective equipment for poll workers. Um, we've had to deal with questions of there's the statewide mask mandate in effect, and we want everyone uh, coming to vote to wear a mask, you know, uh, keep six feet apart, but people also can't be denied a ballot if they are um, foolish enough not to. And so we're just all of these scenarios that in a normal election we wouldn't encounter and a presidential election is always difficult to administer. So that's been interesting. Um, and just thinking long-term of how it will change uh, elections administration. Uh, we've proposed some reforms that so far, I haven't gone through the legislature, but like being able to request an absentee ballot uh, by going online, just filling out a form online. Um, things that should not be controversial, uh, one party versus another, but unfortunately it does get politicized. Um, so I'll leave it at that as the challenge. I just had my poll worker training, so I got to see a little oh. bit of what you've been working on on the other side Sorry. of it. Um, okay, I guess we'll start with Emily on this one. What constitutes success for you and what what do you love most about what you do? Um, what I love most about what I do is that it's different every day. Um, the news cycle is always changing, always evolving. There's always a new issue to talk about. Um, two years ago, I was in a different office talking about immigration exclusively. Um, now we're talking about jobs in the economy and COVID. Um, it, it's always something new and different. There's always something new to learn um, and it keeps you on your toes, which I absolutely love. It's not, it's, it's more sitting connected to a computer now than it used to be because I'm not physically in the office. Um, but when I am physically in the office and we're not, you know, keeping our distance from everyone because Capitol Hill's running rampant with COVID. <laughs> we, it's, it's a lot of running around with my boss and going to different interviews here, like finding that camera where it's set up, finding that reporter in the hallway, um, trying to connect the reporter to my boss who left from votes through this door. And we've now got to run around and find him so that they can walk and talk on the way back to our office. 
Um, all of that super fast paced, engaging stuff is what I love the most about what I do. Um, what was the other part of that? Um, just what constitutes success for you? Uh, yeah. Um, success for me is, I mean, so there, there are two different ways to look at it. Success for me, what like is, if, am I happy in my job and am I learning something? Um, those are the two biggest things. Now there are also obviously measurables in my job of success. Like, did we win the election? <laughs> Do I still have a job? <laughs> Which is up for grabs every two years. I don't technically know. I'm pretty sure I will this time, but I don't know. <laughs> So um, there's also obviously a success line there. But that being said, when my, I was working for a different boss who did lose two years ago, I didn't feel like that was a failure necessarily either because we had left it all on the playing field and like everything that could have gone right for us did go right. And we still lost. And you have to sort of come to terms with that of it's what the voters wanted. Our district didn't want a Republican anymore. They made that clear. And we did everything. We didn't do anything wrong. We did everything we could to get we, everything we wanted to fall into place, fell into place. Um, but it was just, they didn't want us. That's how democracy works. And then it was time to move on and find a different office where I could um, do it all over again and try to get everything to fall into place. And <laughs> um, so there, there are two different ways to measure, measure success in that. And obviously the more important one is the feeling of success if I'm happy in my career. I'm doing something I love. I'm learning something every day. Uh, that's the more important one, um, but the other one's kind of fun to have too. <laughs> it's a good little spur for you. I'm sure. Um, Brad, could you um, expand on what constitutes success for you and what you love the most about your job? Definitely. I mean, there is no such thing as a boring day in politics. I mean, every day starts with your boss walking into your office and ruining everything you had planned for the day and you're off to learn something brand new and you're going to deal with a new problem that you didn't know existed um, whether it be someone is now attacking you for something or all of the priorities have shifted for whatever the case may be or your boss woke up that day and just felt differently about the world which happens a lot more than you would think uh, and emily's nodding to that um yeah you know, success um is Definitely, am I happy? Am I growing? Is there a future? Um, but if you're on a campaign or you're working on a particular bill, there is no feeling like watching your candidate win on election night and being in the ballroom when all the balloons drop or watching the president sign a bill into law that you've been working on for years. Uh, that is just like a truly small moment in time where you will feel really, really good. I'm sure it's an incredible feeling. Um, Jeff, could you talk a little bit about that question as well? Sure. Um, I would echo what they said about finding a role where you feel challenged, where your skills, and talents, and interests line up with um, a way of serving others effectively and really making a difference. Um, don't just go for the job that pays the most or uh, has the fanci fanciest title. Um, yes, you need to pay bills, but um, that won't be what makes you happy in the end. Um, and yeah, I, I'd say in terms of what I'm doing right now, when I got my absentee ballot for this election and um, could see, well, this was my own work involved, um, the design of the ballot, the design of the envelopes and sending it back, seeing it tracked, um, that was very satisfying. And um, just to work where um, you can be excited about the outcome of it. Thank you so much. Okay, um, our next question is, what do you think is most exciting about your work? Um, why don't we go back to Jeff? Okay, um, I, I think I touched on that a little bit of uh, just seeing the impact. And um, I think in my work, I keep in mind that for every complaint we receive, there are hundreds of voters that were able to successfully cast a ballot and 
um, democracy is still works in the end. Um, and I, I think I, I enjoy the problem solving nature of my work. Um, every day we have 88 counties um, in Ohio and I work with all 88 county boards of elections on dealing with uh, the scenarios they encounter. So um, I, I find that exciting just to um, find solutions for them. Thank you, Brad, do you wanna continue? Definitely. You know, I, the thing I love about politics is you're at the center of the action, you know, whether you're in DC or you're in a state capital, you are in your twenties and thirties working with U S senators and the president's team and helping to craft legislation. I've talked to three members of Congress today from my living room and that's a normal day um, in working in these organizations on Capitol Hill. Um, and you actually get to see in three days, a member of Congress I talked to earlier today is going to show up on my little co-sponsorship tracker for a bill I asked her to sign on to. And that's because I got it right. And I'll probably harass Emily later about some bills for her boss too. Uh, but like you, there's just real actual stuff that you're helping happen on a really big scale when you're in politics or government. And it's cool to see that play out. Yeah, on Thank my you. end, um, being in the room where it happens, like as cheesy as that sounds, because Hamilton, whatever, but <laughs> being in the room where it happens is absolutely the most exciting thing about my job, knowing that what I'm doing every day has the potential to make a real difference for real people in this country, um, whether it's in my old job fighting for dreamers or in my new job fighting to help bring more CARES Act dollars or back to our district to get that manufacturing plant up and running and make sure that they don't have to lay off employees or help that small business keep their doors open for another couple months as we try to get another COVID package passed. Um, trying to get that COVID package passed, trying to put forth something that's bipartisan, um, which we put forth a proposal two weeks ago that no one's taken up. It gets frustrating, but it's always exciting because you're in the room where decisions are being made, you're having an impact on it, um, for me, when one of my talking points shows up on the news and it's not my boss saying them, that's an exciting moment because it means that they worked, <laughs> that, that someone else is like, oh, that's a good line. We're going to use that. That's the narrative that we're going for. Like when, when, it, whether it's McCarthy, who's the majority leader of the house or, or someone else in my party, or even the president occasionally, even though we don't agree on a lot of things has used my talking points twice. <laughs> and it was one of the most exciting things that could ever happen to see someone with that seal in front of them using words that I wrote <laughs> to talk about an issue that my boss was championing. Um, whether you like them or not, that's not the point. The point was someone cool using my talking points. <laughs> but it's absolutely awesome to be able to see things like that happen and see the impact that my work has the potential to make and that all of our work has the potential to make on, on this country. Um, is absolutely an exhilarating feeling. And that's why probably all three of us do what we do is having the potential to make a difference for people here, um, people in our communities where we grew up, people in our state, people around the country, and even potentially people across the world um, is a really incredible feeling to be able to see your work, have the, the ability and potential to shape things like that. Thank you so much. Okay, since we only have a couple minutes left, I'm gonna skip to the advice question. Um, looking back, what advice would you give to your younger self if you were first starting your career? Um, why don't we start with Brad? Sure, I would say get started as early as possible go find an internship between high school and college and volunteer on a campaign or in a legislative office somewhere. They will be happy to have you and you will just start that career ladder so much earlier. The first few years of campaign work or legislative office work 
are really grunt work intensive. You are answering phones and knocking on doors and opening the mail. And you can do that when you're 18 or 17 and be working your way up that career ladder. There's no age test for these jobs. It is, did you do the one below it already? And this earlier you get started, the quicker you're going to move right on up. Thank you so much. Why don't we go to Jeff? Yeah, um, certainly take advantage of all of those opportunities with internships. And, um, but also, I, I would say to my younger self not to worry too much about uh, if you don't know where you'll end up after college or what exactly you want to do when you grow up. Um, make the, the most of the opportunities available. Uh, I hope you would find something you enjoy learning about and that challenges you, but um, frankly, I don't know what I, I want to do when I grow up um, five years from now, where I'll be. Um, so don't stress about that too much. Thank you so much. And Emily, do you want to close for us? Sure. Um, my advice would be don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions in your first internship, in your first job. You're never going to know it all at the beginning. Um, I, everyone wants to know it all at the beginning, but you're never gonna, so don't be afraid to ask questions. People are there to help. Don't be afraid to ask questions of connections that you have. Don't be afraid to ask for advice about, you know, which one of these internships do you think is a better opportunity? Which one do you think has more growth potential? Where should I look for that next internship? How do I look for that next internship? Um, how do I get to where you are? People in politics, love talking about themselves. If you're asking them about themselves, they will absolutely talk for days. So don't be afraid to ask that question. They will love it and you will get invaluable advice from it. Um, so just ask questions. Don't stop asking questions. Um, don't be afraid to ask the dumb question because there isn't one. Sometimes there sort of is, but there really never is. <laughs> so don't be afraid to ask questions and get those connections and follow up with the, your connections over time. Um, that's, that's my advice. Just ask questions, follow up with your connections, get people's life stories as you're get, asking the questions and go from there. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. It was wonderful to get to hear all of your expertise.